This is the podcast for H.J. Chapman Freelance Law Practice. On Saturday the 11th of May 2013, I was lucky enough to be invited to give a talk to 20 or so MBA students at the University of New York in Prague, together with Albert Balladini and Jana Volkova. Albert Balladini has completed law school in the United Kingdom and currently works for Richcliffe Consultancy, a substantial property developer active in Central Europe and the United Kingdom. Jana Volkova is an advocate qualified in the Czech Republic who works for renowned constitutional law firm Tom and Devati and Partners. And the details about me, Howard Chapman, are available on my website, www.hjchapman.com. As regards this session, the group was highly energetic and engaged throughout the day's worth of presentations, where we sought to explain the basics of certain legal concepts and the ways that lawyers can be used to help their businesses grow. We have reproduced all of the talks as a series of short audio streams. In case you are not at the talk, we hope this is the next best thing, and in any case, we hope this is useful to you. So on with the show. The second section is called Understanding Structures, and basically, I wanted to describe this because there is a very regular process. Lawyers are not traditionally the most creative of brains. Uh, It comes from reading far, far, far too many books that are just not very interesting in content. And basically... I like all books. All right, I've got some you can borrow. (laughs) But um, the process for doing these transactions is pretty standardised across all of Albert's map of Europe and the States, and the Canada, and Australia, and Asia. There's a fairly regular process for doing transactions of of different natures, but it's pretty consistent. So this section is about that process. Um, Cutting it down to its bones, it normally involves approaching another person, another party, and you'd usually wish to set some kind of rules of engagement, terms of engagement, if you like. That can be an NDA, it might be or sort of NDA, I mean, non-disclosure agreement, it was mentioned before, sort of, it's also known in the trade as a confidentiality agreement, CA or CONFI, something like that. It's pretty much the same all over. <laughs> There's then a fact find. I mentioned that the key issue about transactions is valuation. So there would have to be some kind of investigation. Even if I go to a shop and pick up an apple, I still look at the apple to see if it's any good. And with a company or key asset, you've got people looking at all kinds of information. You, I mean, that, that's known in the trades of data room generally for buying or selling a company or a business. For a 50 to 100 million euro company, I'd expect to see this wall here covered in lever arch files full of documents about the company and that would be called a data room. They would be corporate in nature, they relate to the key contracts, title, environmental issues, employees, that sort of thing. Anything that enables someone to calculate the value of the company. uh, In modern times, the last few years, people tend to put that online um, for environmental reasons, travel costs, lawyers' fees, savings, that sort of thing. And that would be a virtual data room so when people talk about e-data rooms or virtual data rooms, they mean basically that. People would go through a limited amount of information in a real hurry, probably less than a week, probably a day or two, and they would produce what they call an indicative offer, an indicative price. They say, I will buy this form from you for this much money on in a non-binding way. Is that of interest? And then the seller will say, no, go away, or yes, continue, and people go back to the data room and they amass huge reports saying this is a full valuation of the asset that we've made, and you can put in um, a final price saying, I will pay this much for the company, this is actually the price. As part of that price, as I said, you normally submit a contract with your final terms, so you say, I will pay you 100 for this, and that's the contract that I'm prepared to sign. Um, in a particularly sort of overt way 
Uh, and then that's usually the basis for negotiations because no one ever accepts that. So the negotiation process goes, if you're lucky, people get to the signing, they're still friends, and then you go through a further process of trying to get the final asset transfer. That normally involves satisfying a bank that it's acceptable to lend money. It's not that common to buy things straight out for cash. Even in the really big deals, it's usual to borrow large sums of money. So you need to satisfy a bank that it's able to lend the money, which is a completely separate process that usually is probably more in favour than me. Um, even if you manage to transfer the title, you still haven't finished. There are still things that you have to do afterwards under the terms of a typical agreement. So, for example, you, you might want to register the purchase of a property with the local property register. You've done everything you have to do as a lawyer, but you're still waiting for the counterparty to register and things like that. So, you, even when you've done it, you've not done it. You never No, never, never finished. <laughs> no, you have after that. <laughs> And that's why you always need loan. Yeah, but that's why many transactions can take months. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. It's not something um, that it's done in a week or two weeks. I mean, Lemon Brothers was sold over a weekend, but that is a real exception. Your average, average due diligence is probably between a week and a month. Um, it depends on the complications that affects the transaction. A key, a key point that makes it viable at all is a tax structure. I won't go into too much because it's highly complex and individual for each state, but that can determine whether transactions are difficult or easy. If it involves many jurisdictions, you've got lawyers in every single one of the jurisdictions for every single one of the parties. So you've got the queue of people coming out the door now for the deal, deal team. You've got people that you don't even get to the room. Um, you've got Funding, if you're obtaining external funding, it depends how reasonable the bank's going to be to lend. That can make transactions much more difficult, and it certainly makes it more com complex. In a, in a low-budget transaction, paradoxically, even a very low-value one, that can be extremely complicated because everybody's trying to save money with everything. And it, it squeezes the time, and it squeezes things into the documents that, that sometimes it's very difficult to deal with just because everyone's trying to save money. Um, above all, perhaps, it's just the personalities. Um, you can meet some extremely difficult personalities, and there are a lot of personalities in the room, and particularly high value. Some people are quite difficult. That's the end of my second section. Any, any questions about structures or so anything the, that I may be... The initial price about? is like they, they take a sneak peek into the data and they yes. offer an initial price. Is there any... Uh, how much? How much is it? How much does it differ to the real price at the end? Of, because what if they say we buy it for 100 million and they they do really evaluation and they say uh, 50? Well, um, come on, you lost well, a lot of time. What what you might say, and I'll come to this in a minute. But you've got things like warranty protections and things that you ask for typically in a document. So you you might say I'm I'm going to guarantee for you that there is title to all the assets and that there's all these other things, and for that. It's, uh, it's um, 100 million or whatever. But that price would greatly change if you say, I don't care about the guarantees. I want it for 50 million, and I will take the risk. So that, that sort of thing does, so that might affect things in the negotiations. I did, I did a deal um, with a, a large check company, I'm not sure I can say which one it is, a few years ago, and they said, Friday, we, we must sign today, it's 50, price is 50. We, we got to, we couldn't do it Friday, they had an argument and they fell out and they went home. And um, we came back on Monday and then price is 70. <laughs> so why is that? Yeah. It was 50. That was Friday's deal. <laughs> it, but that's personality driven. Um, but generally speaking, you vary the terms to vary the price. Um, if one kind of price is acceptable and another one isn't, then you would accommodate them in the terms. Did you have me, Sorry? Do you often let the selling party just over the weekend, for example, completely change their mind and say, okay, in fact, I don't want to sell it? Um, Does it happen often? What, what happens a lot is that if you've got multiple counterparties, 
they'll go full on with one counterparty. They'll reach a point where they're ready to sign, and somebody will just go, but I'll pay more. <laughs> and then, I mean, if you've got an exclusivity clause, then that's why it's good to have an exclusivity clause, because that can't happen. But if there's no exclusivity, somebody just come along and go, I'll pay more. And that, that happens a lot, that people just go, OK, <laughs> I'll put along with this guy. Two parties have signed a letter of intent, and then somebody else comes, a third one, and says, I'm going to offer more. So you, I've got my company, which is, which is in negotiations with Peter's wife, we signed an LOI, um, and then um, Bradley's company comes and offers more for, for the buyer, so we the same the letter of intent is precisely that, same as a memorandum of understanding. Um, in order to create a contract under Czech law and English, and, and lots of others as well, you, you need to have the intention to create something which is enforceable before a court. Um, a letter of intent is not. What it means, today I intend to do this, like a comfort letter. I, I mean to, I do intend to, I, I'm trying, but that's not enforceable. Is, um, so basically, unless it actually says, I promise not to deal with anyone else, and that is meant to be enforceable before a court, then um, there's nothing you can do, but that's the risk that you take. It's still better to have it as opposed to not having it. Yeah. It's like signing an agreement. If you want to buy it, just sign it. <laughs> if you don't sign it, um, then you've got nothing. <laughs> it, Yes. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. You would say, I promise to deal with you in an exclusive basis in relation to the sale of this property. You have to narrow it down. Um, I'll not talk to a third party um, other than your directors or advisors or something like that for three months. Yeah. Three months is probably quite generous. The Czech, Czech law, you probably you can put fixed penalties to these things. So you put down? Is that my next question? Oh, yes. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll come to that, I'll, but why not now? Um, essentially, the, if you're a buyer, the most powerful tool that you've got, leave all the lawyers out of it, the most powerful tool that you've got as a buyer is the money. So, uh, on the other hand, if you're the seller, you want the money. So some people don't want time wasters using up management time. So they insist on down payments in advance. Sometimes they're returnable and sometimes they're not returnable. Uh, but equally, if you're a buyer, you don't want to put down any money. You want to wait as long as possible, preferably never pay. <laughs> signed and you've started to discuss with the, the counterparty that's yes. signing the LOI. Yes. You can supersede the LOI, that's no problem. If you try to negotiate with one party and you, you're just you are not in good faith, you're in bad faith, you know that you're not going to sell it to them, you're going to sell to another party. A lot of legal systems, including Czech, will say you're liable for the costs of the first party that you were in bad faith with. Exactly. Um, so they think they're contractual, it's just in terms of bad faith. So you can... Sorry. But you can, you can override and say, we're not, we're not doing the LOI anymore, we're going straight to the deal. It's, it's only intent. It's very, very little of it is enforceable. And normally you would state, if it's a good one, you would state in the LOI, this letter is not enforceable except for clause five, confidentiality, clause six, exclusivity, and that's it. In Italy, there are there have been examples where they were wise being construed as a contract. And there were yeah. so detailed yes. that a judge would come up and say, well, yes, it does, it does say it's not binding, but it's got so many clauses and it's a little bit of a contract between two parties. So one could say, one couldn't just leave the agency. Okay. So they were responsible for it. So just be careful, 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 just be careful
So all that remains is for me to give a huge thanks to Aaron Johnson, course director of the MBA program at the University of New York in Prague. To find out more about the MBA course, please go to www.unypunit.cz. Otherwise, many thanks for listening. Thank you.